Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us at this Global Investigative Journalism Network webinar in which we'll discuss how the Christian right is funding political causes overseas. I'm genuinely excited about the three speakers who are rock stars in their own field. And I know that at least some of you share this excitement because we've had well over 300 registrations for this webinar. And before I introduce them, I want to quickly speak about what connects them. All three have investigated how Christian conservative groups are exporting intolerance by quietly spending millions of dollars on movements that want to roll back women's and LGBTIQ rights. The money of these conservative Christian groups supports authoritarian political parties, as well as ultra conservative causes, and it's doing so in Europe and Africa and in Latin America. Tracking such money is best done in form of international collaborations and with a well developed methodology, and this is one we want to explore today in this session. I'm sure that for most of you, it's not the first GIJN webinar, and you know that it's a great place to learn from peers. It's never boring, and there are always plenty of practical tips. So I have the pleasure of hosting this conversation. My name is Juliana Rufus, and some of you know me as the reporter of Al Jazeera's People in Power series, even though I've recently gone back to freelancing. So um, time to introduce our three fantastic speakers. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, with the youngest, who is Lydia Nam Namubiru, who is the Africa editor of Open Democracy. She's from Uganda and specializes in data journalism. Previously, Lydia has worked for Quartz in Africa, the New York Times, the BBC World Service, as well as the Vision Group, which is Uganda's largest media company. Lydia teaches data journalism at the African Center for Media Excellence in Kampala and curates open data on www.data.ug as Uganda. And she also runs an African feminist investigative newsroom. So what can I say? Um, then we also have the excellent Claire Provost, who is the global investigations editor at Open Democracy. Claire will be focusing on the Open Democracy project, tracking the backlash against women's and LGBTIQ rights. Before joining Open Democracy as their gender and sexuality editor, Claire has worked at the Guardian newspaper as a data journalist. She was selected as a senior fellow at the Center for Investigative Journalism at the University of London and Goldsmiths. And then last but not least, we have Giannina Sanini, who probably needs little introduction to the GIJN community. But just in case you haven't heard of Giannina, she is the director of the MSc Data Journalism Program at Columbia University in New York. Previously, she was the head of the investigative team at La Nación in Costa Rica. And Janina is also one of the five founding members of CLIP. And CLIP is the Latin American Center for Investigative Journalism. And she's received several international prizes for her work. So lastly, before we start, I want to squeeze in also a little bit of information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network just in case you're joining us for the first time. GIJN is the largest global network of non-profit investigative journalism organizations, and it can proudly count over 200 member organizations in 80 countries around the world. But you don't have to be a member. GIJN works with journalists everywhere, including non-profits, commercial organizations, and of course, freelancers. The website is gijn.org, and on it you'll find a massive range of resources and tip sheets covering all aspects of investigative journalism, so it's definitely worth having a look. And then this is really the last thing before we start. Um, we do want to hear from you, from everybody who's in this session, and we want it to be as interactive as possible. And to do so, please send us written messages. I'm sure you've all been to this before. I can already see some 11 messages in the in the chat down there. Please send us messages in the Q&A box. 
you can start asking questions from now on. And then after we've heard the speaker presentations, our GIJN colleague Hannah Kugens will join us to moderate the questions. And this session will be recorded, as you can probably see, and then you'll find it, you can find it on YouTube afterwards, and please, please share it on social media. So it's time to start with the first person, with our first presenter, and that is Claire Provost uh, from the UK. Claire, you have published a series of investigative pieces for open democracy, and they all look at the millions of US dollars that are pouring into Europe to boost the far right. Why did you start looking at this issue in the first place? Um, Juliana, do you want me to, should I start sharing my screen at this yeah, point? Please do. Okay, great. Um, okay, so thank you again. Um, I, I'm really happy to be here with everyone today. Um, so our project, uh, the project that I run at Open Democracy is called Tracking the Backlash. Um, and it is a uniquely, unique and global uh, feminist investigative journalism project that investigates threats to women's and LGBT rights with the same seriousness as our colleagues investigate other global threats to democracy uh, from tax evasion to climate change. Um, we are also investing in the capacity of more, more women and LGBT people to do investigative work. Um, our current team is led by women and LGBT people, 16 people over four continents, um, including five fellows in training positions. Um, and uh, what we investigate every day with the seriousness of our colleagues that investigate other global threats to democracy um, include uh, far right, religious right and ultra conservative movements and groups dark money influence on politics, courts, education, health systems, um, use of misinformation and other controversial tactics. Um, uh, but how we work together is as important uh, to who we are as what we investigate. And so that is um, collaboratively and cross-border, um, cross-region, in, in, in fact. Um, very methodically, um, we uh, uh, use replication and pilot pilot projects often. Um, uh, we use a wide suite of investigative tools and we also uh, train ourselves uh, constantly on um, new techniques or um, uh, to further develop our skills at the same time as we do an investigation. So at the same time as doing a data journalism project, we will do data journalism trainings for every member of our team um, so that we build that capacity while we do important work. Um, uh, and before I show you some of our follow the money work and explain how we did it, uh, I wanted to set the scene. Um, uh, and this responds to your question, Juliana, why we basically why we do what we do. Um, and so the scene I wanted to set for you uh, um, is in early 2019. Uh, at this moment, across Europe, political parties were looking towards the European Parliament elections that May many voters and journalists were paying attention to because of, uh, because of big things that were happening. Uh, Far-right parties were targeting record seats um, and Steve Bannon, the controversial Trump campaign strategist said publicly he was going to be involved and help unite the right. Um, in Italy, where I'm based, uh, we were seeing far-right leaders publicly attack feminists and same-sex parents in their speeches uh, in addition to migrant rights and, and sometimes at the same time. Um, at the top uh, right hand of the screen right now, you can see Georgia Maloney from the far right party Fratelli d'Italia, and she's holding a banner that says, we defend God, nation, and family. Below you can see Matteo Salvini from the Lega party in Italy holding a t-shirt of the traditional, quote unquote, traditional family that these movements defend a married man and a woman and their biological children, no space for single parents, LGBT people, surrogacy, IVF, anything that deviates from that image. Um, he's holding that up uh, at a global summit of far right and religious right groups called the World Congress of Families uh, that meets uh, generally every year. Um, it met in 2019 in March in Verona, a couple months ahead of the elections. Um, and on stage alongside uh, far right leaders like Salvini were activists from the US pledging to help make Europe great again. 
Um, uh, so that's the scene I wanted to set. Uh, you know, so there was a lot at stake here in 2019 in terms of the direction of European uh, politics at a, at a regional level. Um, and the far right uh, had made its uh, uh, intentions clear. Um, uh, and uh, we were seeing um, US uh, activists, both prominent ones like Steve Bannon and also others that were flying under the radar um, saying that they were going to help unite the right, make Europe great again, also publicly announcing intentions. Um, and so around this time, shortly before that summit in Verona, we had noticed these trends and started to follow the money from U.S. Christian right groups that are active internationally, many of whom that are um, have ties to the Trump administration or to that World Congress of Families network that was going to meet in Verona. Uh, we ended up focusing on 12 groups, and between them, we found that they had poured at least $50 million of uh, dark money into Europe over the last decade. We call it dark money because none disclosed who their own funders are, where the money originally comes from, and it intends to influence politics, public opinion. Uh, uh, also um, uh, funded and built armies of ultra-conservative lawyers and political activists. Um, targeting courts, uh, as well as public opinion and parliaments, um, uh, funding campaigns against LGBT rights, sex education and abortion. And they were spending, $50 million is likely to be the tip of the iceberg um, for a number of reasons, which I will mention in a minute um, in terms of the data source. Um, but the scale of money we documented was nonetheless uh, on a scale, not uh, uh, what people told us was it was on a scale not previously imagined. Um, lawmakers and human rights activists said this was shocking. Um, the findings from this investigation were also picked up by many other media outlets, as you can see with some examples um, on the left, uh, because these issues were so, because of how topical these issues were, but also because of how little other data and follow the money work had been done on these groups. There was very little else, else out there. There still is relatively little out there. Um, and so, for all the journalists on the call, this is an area so fruitful to explore, um, I think. Um, behind the headlines of those stories was a big data journalism project, um, locating, compiling, and analyzing the data disclosed by uh, the US groups that we were looking at, which were all registered in the US as nonprofits and filed these 990 forms, what you're seeing on, the, on, the, on this screen that disclose some information annually of, about their finances. Um, these are annual filings filed to the IRS and they include many, many sections in them. But one of the sections uh, is called Schedule F. That's what you're seeing here, an example of. And that is about uh, US non, that's where US nonprofits disclose their international spending. Um, the details are often slim but it, there's often fought, they're, they're, they're often slim, but still more than what you can find from other sources. So there's still a useful source of information. Um, uh, some organizations file these forms in different ways. They're not all consistent. The example you're seeing here is of one of an organization that lists every country that it has sent money to. Um, however, it doesn't list the grantee organization because it's not required. Um, uh, some, some US groups only list the region of their spending because that is the bare minimum of what they're required to do. Um, uh, so a lot of what we had to do for this project was go through these forms that are um, uh, filled out in very different ways, pull that data together. Claire, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm just gonna, um, I'm just getting a message from the interpreters um, that it would be great if we can slow down a little bit so that we can get it right in all languages. Thank you. Okay. Um, because, uh, because these organizations file forms in um, somewhat inconsistent ways, a lot of the work here was, that we had to do was not necessarily technical, but um, going, uh, pulling together all of the data as currently disclosed um, into a spreadsheet and then creating our own coding columns to reconcile it. Um, uh, this, this investigation, um, uh, and I think a very important thing or about this or important lesson is that this investigation essentially replicated a very common data journalism project in the US um, uh, or many common data journalism projects in the US that have focused on other sections of these filings. 
Um, and what we did was different was focus on these international spending schedule F forms and for quite a big number of groups. Um, however, um, we didn't stop uh, with the data at that um, in the, during that investigation. Um, and this is an important point um, in that the, there's limitations clearly in what these forms um, give you, but they do provide a lot of leads um, and doing further uh, reporting um, of any kind is uh, necessary to follow the money further to the ground. And in this case, we wanted to know more about how this money and the groups that we were looking at were um, supporting the far right in the European elections campaign. Um, and so we also went undercover at that World Congress of Family Summit in Verona, the one where Matteo Salvini held up the t-shirt of the traditional family and the U US speakers helped pledge to make Europe great again. Uh, and we, po we sent two people who posed as uh, potential donors to the far right themselves. Um, and they learned uh, through uh, over three three day period um, how to get around campaign finance laws on transparency and donation limits. Um, uh, they were given this advice by far right and religious right actors at that summit. Um, they were also told about specific plans to run attack ads against far right opponents. Um, and how a World Congress of Families partner in Spain was being compared to a super PAC in the US, which refers to really controversial groups in America that can spend unlimited sums influencing elections and are well known for aggressive and negative campaigning and officially do not exist in Europe, are completely unregulated if they, if they did. Um, Europe lawmakers called these uh, findings as well explosive uh, and called for urgent um, further investigations by European and national authorities. Uh, and we continued to follow, follow the money, however. Um, and last year ahead of the US elections, uh, in, in October, we released a much bigger package looking not only at US Christian rights spending in Europe, but US, US Christian rights spending around the world um, and we looked at a much larger group of organizations, 28. Um, and we followed the money to the ground in Africa, Latin America, and in Europe. Um, and uh, we found, we looked, for example, at how some of it was being used to specifically target European courts. Um, in Latin America, uh, we also found it connected to groups spreading, spreading misinformation about COVID and women's health. Um, these findings were also covered by media out globally, which shows the, again, why this is such a fruitful area for journalists to focus on. There's, um, it is it is absolutely in the public interest, and this is, we've seen that this is very quickly understood. Uh, um, uh, again, behind this uh, project was a much bigger spreadsheet of these 28 groups um, and uh, spending in every region of the world. Um, we also, you see on this screen on the right, a methodology note that was produced, um, uh, which uh, documents every step of this project and also has a detailed guide to the data. Um, both of these are resources that are, uh, we're very happy to share with other journalists anytime. Um, and you can find our contact details on the website, www.opendemocracy.net slash tracking the backlash. Um, and the methodology note uh, could also be useful for anyone who's interested in uh, replicating um, some part of this or looking at different organizations. Um, if you did want to work with our data um, uh, itself, on our website we do have a, um, a data, an interactive visualization that allows you to explore it at quite a high level, but it's quite useful to look at trends um, over time by organization, by region, by category of organization. Um, and then if you wanted to go further into the, the detail, you could either contact us or you could go to yourself, yourself to the, the source, the, um, the 990 forms and the Schedule F for international spending. And there are many different portals online to um, help you explore these forms. They're filed to the IRS, but the IRS portal, I would suggest uh, um, avoiding. Uh, I, I, it's, not, it's not very useful and there's a lot of limitations. Um, the IRS website is extremely helpful for guides to the forms and understanding what organizations are supposed to fill out and where and why. Um, but uh, ProPublica's Data Explorer, um, this one I, which I've linked to here, 
um, projects.propublica.org slash nonprofits is um, the, my favorite portal to explore these. Um, there are um, important limitations to all of this data, however, um, and the one that I wanted to flag uh, in particular is that some religious groups are not required to file these forms. It depends on the details of how they're registered. Um, and so the true amount of money coming from the US Christian right into countries around the world will be much larger than what we've been able to capture um, and what, you, what you'll be able to see in any of these forms. So to end, I, I just want to put a couple of bullet points uh, of our top line learnings from doing this work uh, and wanted to close by saying that it would have been really impossible without cross-border and cross-regional collaboration because that was, that's been essential to follow the money to the ground um, and tell the stories about why this matters. Um, and also this work would have been impossible without the front and center and role and leadership of women and LGBT people who among other things did extremely like crucial um, uh, undercover work. And my colleague Lydia um, Namubiru, who's our Africa editor in Uganda will explain that um, further in a, in a minute. Um, as our project is based on collaboration, please do get in touch if you're interested in doing similar investigations or wanna share your work with us. Um, among other things, we can share our data sets, methodology notes, we're also working on new projects and we're actively looking for new collaborators in Africa, Latin America, and Eurasia. And for any editors on the call, all of our stories are published on Creative Commons um, licenses, which are, so it means it's free for other non-commercial republishing. And then commercial publishers are also very welcome to get in touch with us too. Um, there is so much that has yet to be investigated in, in this area and it absolutely requires collaboration to do it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. That was super interesting and also really appreciated that you're so open to um, to collaboration and that you're sharing your tips. Uh, I'm going to ask each panelist a question or two, um, but I'm not going to spend much time uh, so that you all get to ask more questions in the end. But uh, is this ongoing? Is Open Democracy planning on doing more work in this or are you moving on to something else? No, um, the Track in the Backlash project is an ongoing one um, with a team of 16 people on four continents. It's ongoing and we're expecting to grow quite a lot more this year. So um, uh, yeah, absolutely ongoing and expanding. And are you able to say what direction you'll be looking next or are you keeping that closed for obvious reasons? Well, a little bit of both, you know, like, um, we do want to collaborate with other people and we also do want to see more of this work being done. So uh, broadly, more follow the money work is going to be, ha is going to be happening. Um, more uh, uh, looking at um, some, some crucial upcoming elections around the world um, and the role that some of these groups are looking to play in those elections. Um, so follow the money elections. Uh, misinformation has been a major theme of ours and it's going to continue to be one. Um, those are three, three key themes. I will also say that we're going to be doing more work on um, the opposition against LGBT rights in particular this year. Great. And yes, then in the spirit of uh, global collaboration and working together to, to, to discover the real scale and impact uh, of this funding, the next person we'll speak to is Claire's colleague, Lydia Namuburu, who is in Kampala, Uganda, and who also worked on this project. So Lydia, like Claire, you have looked at this American money from right-wing Christian sources, but you've tracked the, this money flow into Africa, and you've also made the decision to link these flows with strong human stories on the ground. So what can you tell us about the work that you've done? Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Lydia. All right, uh, and should I share my screen, my presentation or? Uh, yeah, if you have a presentation. All right, uh, let me know if, if you can see it. All right, sorry, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Yeah, we can see you fine. I think you just need to- All right. Back. Yeah, so, so like Claire said, there's a limit to what you can learn from looking at uh, 
the 990s and other open data sources of, or, um, of, of these organizations. So you can tell how much money has gone to at least regions. Sometimes you can tell to which countries, but more often than not, you can't tell to which actual beneficiary, which organization in this, in this region got the money. And, and I think it's impossible to know why it's, it's often difficult to appreciate why it matters until you, you go to the field and like look at, look, look at what uh, find, actually find the, the people who receive the money uh, or the networks of people who receive the money and what it is they do. So, so we have, uh, we are actively looking at, at, at money from these sources, as you can see, as Claire was showing earlier, we have we, we've put a lot of time into compiling data on what these organizations have spent. And uh, I'm gonna walk you through one instance in which we have followed the money to the ground. So we noticed uh, through a variety of investigation and research techniques that I'll go into in, in a minute, we notice at least two uh, organizations that are that supports global networks of so-called crisis pregnancy centers, uh, and so we're wondering what are crisis pregnancy centers? What do they do? They're not they're not necessarily a new phenomenon. They're very popular in the U.S. and they are controversial there. So we're looking at oh, but do, do they look the same outside? And what do they do uh, to promote sort of these conservative causes elsewhere? So. We, um, so like Claire was saying, uh, I mean, even just becoming interested in this started with undercover work and hearing these organizations, what agendas they were chasing uh, by my colleagues at the Verona World Congress of Families. And in fact, uh, the World Congress of Families is an interesting organization for you to take note of as it is sort of a network and network of networks of these organizations that uh, are seeking ultra conservative agendas around the world. Uh, so it's women, women's uh, sources in the women's rights movement are already familiar with a lot of these organizations. Uh, we did some additional open source research looking at um, some, some of the 990s come with additional data to the to schedule F and some of it, like the, the detail that's provided there varies, but it's always worth looking into it. You may find uh, information that saves you a lot of work. Look at prior news reporting by these stories. They're US organizations very often, even though they're seen sort of as benign in the rest of the world, they are, they've been, there's been lots of coverage that gives you a sense of why they are controversial or what their agendas over the years have been. Um, I think lots of my colleagues tracking the backlash on the tracking the backlash team are signed up to lots of newsletters. Uh, some of us have ban accounts on social media. It's sort of a virtual way to embed into these organizations and understand them a bit a bit more. And of course, good old uh, Google alerts on these organizations and their key figures, whom you can read of their 990s, also sometimes turn up interesting information on them or you know updates on their on how what they're moving to do uh, so we went uh, having so using a mix of those methods we we, we recognize these two organizations heartbeat international and human life international uh, uh, as supporting a network of crisis pregnancy centers so we sent reporters around the world in 18 countries to go undercover to find what crisis pregnancy centers do and hear some of the stories, sort of striking stories in the different places that reporters went undercover that we found. So a common theme across was basically misinformation on what abortion procedures are, how you will be impacted by, by get, how a woman might be impacted by getting an abortion, um, you know, like, uh, and it, some of the information, the misinformation is pretty ridiculous. Uh, you know, like, like being told your husband will turn gay after you've had an abortion or um, 
being, uh, but a lot of it is also very, very common if you're in countries that are uh, already quite conservative, you've had a lot of this. Uh, you may be aborting the next president of the country, those sorts of things. Uh, but, and a lot of it is, um, but some of some things were actually also surprising. So for instance, these two organizations spend, uh, in terms of foreign spending, Africa is their biggest uh, spending region, is the region they spend the most on, which was surprising because if they are anti-abortion, if their agenda is anti-abortion, abortion is often uh, illegal in most African countries. So we're wondering what are they doing? And what we found in a crisis pregnancy center in Uganda is that they go well beyond discouraging abortion. They discourage contraception, they badmouth comprehensive sexuality education. It was, um, it was very, it was, it was very, it was, it, it was quite surprising, even to Ugandan uh, policymakers who are not necessarily progressive in terms of abortion, but how much, how 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 far the agenda, how extreme essentially the cons the, the conservative agenda is, really gives name to, it really gives meaning to the term ultra conservative. Uh, but also they are, and you tend to find lots of them in whichever, in, in, on the continent, in whichever countries have slightly more liberal abortion laws and, um, you know, they will violate whatever, uh, they tend to violate some of the laws around abortion. For instance, South Africa requires that counseling of a, wo a woman with a, in, in pregnancy cannot be directional. You cannot tell them that they can, you, you can't like push them towards an abortion, nor can you push them away from it. You just have to give them all of the information. But of course the centers are doing what, you know, saying only as much as pushes an ultra conservative agenda, which is do not, you do not seek an abortion, even in this environment where you legally could. So yeah, uh, our undercover reporting was in 18 countries, but there's also some virtual undercover reporting. For instance, one of our reporters uh, signed up for training by Heartbeat International. And this is where people who work in crisis pregnancy centers around the world are trained on how to, uh, how to basically counsel women who walk into these, uh, these centers uh, and, um, She's in fact the reporter who, um, she's, uh, she's so, so one of the, you can read one of her all of the stories there, which is how I learned to, to talk women out of legal abortions. Um, yeah, but so what's the point of, it's really important to go beyond the data. In our case, it gave us really strong human stories of what is essentially ideological activism passing as healthcare work. And uh, organizations act, uh, sort of health organizations that work around reproductive health, some of them were actually surprised to say, we understand that our work is opposed in terms of lobbying and public communication, but we didn't quite understand that it's also opposed at, uh, at actual service provision, that, that, that it goes that far. Uh, but so, and, but you can get that uh, only by looking at the data. You get uh, uh, that by looking by go by following the, the money to the ground to the human beings who both receive it and the human beings impacted by its movement. Um, but also, I, I think do it, going and reporting it out helped illustrate that there is uniformity to the approach. No matter where you went, misinformation was a very a very, uh, was the, basically the go-to approach for convincing women away from abortions. You can be misinformation about the legal status of abortion in that country, about the impact of abortion, about you know the health uh, risks related to abortion and so on. Uh, but also it suffers like really actionable context specific information for policymakers in different places to understand why they should be concerned. Well, you know, like in Uganda, it was concerning that they discouraged contraception and sex education. 
even though, you know, if you just are reading about it off their own website, they'll say we oppose abortion and lot, uh, we oppose abortion. And a lot of uh, Ugandan policymakers might say, well, it, it is illegal here, so no problem there. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, th I think going beyond the data was really, really impactful and we are actively chasing more leads about them. So if you're looking at, um, um, but there's also some considerations, of course, undercover reporting always, call, always comes with some risks to safety. So you need to do really detailed risk assessments, consider um, safety measures like a body system for reporters going undercover, uh, uh, consider psychological uh, risks. Many reporters rep uh, or who went undercover told us they just felt emotionally drained because in this case, a big part of how they turned women off abortion was basically bludgeoning them you, you know, with, with emotional manipulation. But there's also information security risk. These stories, at least uh, they, they um, stories are often, they often, people react to them in a very strong and polarized manner online. And uh, so you, you need to think about that going, going in publishing and how you publish, how, how public you are about, uh, you know, whether or not you, that you're the one who went undercover and so on. Uh, then of course there are libel risks. These are rich organizations, rich US organizations. The US is a uh, very, oh, it loves, the US loves its courts, uh, private and public. So it's like, it's really crucial that your evidence is, uh, is recorded, consult lawyers before going undercover and publishing, uh, consult lawyers, both where you are going undercover and where your work will be published. Um, invite official responses from these organizations in publishing your work and writing your stories, be uh, as fair as accuracy can allow. Uh, to protect yourself from sort of some sorts of risks. And there's also, like I said, there's often real post-publication backlash, both from the right-wing media, but also, you know, individual users of social media who are sympathetic to these causes. So go in, uh, it's something to consider in your risk assessment and it's something to consider when you publish. Like you may need to defend your work, but you may also need to pull back or escalate the defense to somebody else in the organization uh, who isn't as personally involved in the work. Yeah, and we want to move this story forward to answer your question, uh, Julian. This is an ongoing investigation for us uh, and it will be for many years. Do explore our data, uh, reach out and ask for the access to, uh, access to the database if you want, access to our methodology note. And if any of these organizations or their spending patterns strike you as interesting, please get in touch, pitch us, pitch us stories. We could publish pitch us stories. You might need a collaboration on, um, or, but also just get in touch asking uh, if you need support that we can give, uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you for you too to, to be so open and inviting to people and uh, inviting collaborations. Um, I'm wondering what that look like, looks like in Africa, where the investigative sector is less uh, journalism is less established than um, for many of us in, in the global north. Uh, I think you work practically in three country in Uganda, in South Africa, and in a third country that I have forgotten. Yeah, Zambia. Uh, in Zambia, right. So when you get requests for collaborations, uh, how do you decide who you collaborate with and what shape that should take? And could there be reasons for you to say no and say this is not the right collaborator for us at this particular moment in time? So, so like Claire was saying, first of all, we really care how we work, who, we, who does the work is as, is as important for us as the work. So we'd let, we'd, we especially welcome pitches from women and LGBTIQ 
people because more than anyone, they are their rights are at stake in this. Uh, but uh, but also in terms of uh, like, and we do especially also uh, um, we we especially welcome pictures from Africa, where or Latin America or Eurasia, like uh, Claire was saying, where investigative journalism isn't as strong. We are lucky to have some resources we can put towards investigation. We are lucky to have a team that that's, was specifically selected for their interest in collaboration and working with others, even when their skills aren't, uh, you know, the kind with which you might pitch a commercial publication will work with you. So, so I guess uh, how we might, we might, when might we say no? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we privilege certain uh, working with certain people, but I don't think we have a policy for who would definitely say no to. Okay, well, we'll have more questions later for everybody and keep them coming. I can see the chat is filling up. Um, so all three panelists will take questions afterwards that Hannah is collating uh, as we speak. So going to the third speaker, Janina. Um, collaboration really was also a very big deal for your work and you are well known in terms of your skills as a data journalist but for this the work that you've done in um, uh, right-wing funding you started by looking at personal relationships and meetings between evangelical leaders and members of the White House during President uh, Trump's administrations which was quite rich pickings and then from then on, you worked with 16 partners across Latin America and you all published at the same time, which was explosive. Um, so tell us more about that, the content um, and how you chose to work slightly differently. I think, I mean, if I got it right in our discussions, a little bit less data driven than useful, uh, usual, a little less data driven than usual in this particular investigation. Thank you so much, Juliana, uh, and thank you, GIJN, uh, Dave, Anne, and all the team for organizing this. I'm so happy also to share uh, this panel with uh, my two brilliant colleagues, Claire and Lydia, uh, who have been doing an amazing job, you know, on mapping all this. Uh... So first thing I want to do is walk you through the why. Um, and to give you a little bit of context, you know, in my 30 years of uh, as investigative reporter, uh, mostly investigating corruption and organized crime, I never, never touch religion uh, as a subject. Uh, and I never thought that I was going to do it. And everything happened because I lost my green card. So I couldn't go back to my country in Costa Rica to vote. So I volunteered uh, uh, with the election tribunal to you know, help them here in the voting um, center in New Jersey. So I was running one of the voting tables and uh, 1 p.m., this is Sunday, uh, three new buses came uh, full of people and material propaganda um, supporting one, uh, one of the candidates who was a, an evangelical, is an evangelical leader and who run promising, you know, uh, restricting rights uh, to LGBTQ people. Uh, primarily, that was like the, the Troy horse. Now, why is this important? And I had, I'm summarizing, you know, uh, a really long process of understanding what's wrong with, there's nothing wrong with religion, absolutely nothing. So why, should we address these topics? Uh, well, because there's one word that summarizes everything and it doesn't matter what religion it is, fundamentalism. Fundamentalism, basically what it does is, uh, there's only one way to see the world and there's only one right way to do things. Uh, so what we noticed is all these people came with a new ID to vote for the evangelical leader, they didn't even know the name, but they were obeying clearly. So for the first time I'm there, not as a journalist, as a citizen, seeing something that called my attention, you know, what's going on here? What's the, uh, and then 
uh, we started obviously addressing this uh, first, well, I, I spent the entire summer reading 28 plus books, uh, talking to scholars, because this is not a subject that we're used to cover. Um, <clears throat> and trying to understand, you know, if there are networks, is this a local phenomenon? Is this a global thing? Or is there anybody pulling the strings over there to, uh, you know, manipulate uh, elections and, and people's uh, decisions? So basically, um, I have two hats here. I'm um, the director of the data journalism program, well, three hats. Also, we have a cross-border investigative fellowship at Columbia University. And um, with uh, uh, two other colleagues, we founded the Latin American Center for Investigative Reporting, CLIP. So this is how CLIP was born. This is the first investigation that we did. We started first here in the US, mapping all the organizations, doing pretty much what uh, Lydia and Claire explained before uh, using the 990s. And the, the first um, idea was, OK, let's follow the money. And very soon, we noticed that um, it was not sufficient, all the data that we had, um, and also that the money is not, it is not enough. We, we, we started mapping a list of, uh, you know, listing a number of organizations that work in Latin America uh, and uh, influencing uh, politics. And we gave this list to our partners, first of all, uh, some of, uh, I call them individually, and some of them were like, are you driving crazy? What are you doing investigating religion? Um, and, and no, we don't have that problem here. It's actually not a problem because it's invisible. And the first thing I want to say is uh, it, it has been the hardest thing to investigate, more than any organized crime uh, project, <laughs> because uh, journalists, uh, especially here in, in the US, don't see religion as a subject uh, that we should cover. Uh, but let me tell you something, it's a really important part of the equation of uh, any society. So with this list, our partners went to each of their countries and see, uh, um, you know, just mapping what are the activities, uh, what are the, um, uh, uh, you know, every single meeting, we had a giant timeline. So this is not rocket science investigative reporting. It's, we, of course, we use data to make sense of, uh, of all these networks. And very soon, which is, was not the purpose, of course, um, before this investigation we did, uh, we mapped Donald Trump's business deals across the planet. And believe me, I was ready to, uh, um, you know, get Trump out of the equation of anything. <laughs> But, but very soon we found that it was the White House uh, and particularly uh, uh, Vice President Pence and um, Mike Pompeo who were leading um, some of these efforts. So the White House has a pastor had um, and, and the pastor was acting like a diplomat in the dark, uh, setting up new ministries at the highest level uh in several countries and i have to say that this is not even ideological because uh of course first they were dealing uh they were making deals on the dark with presidents congress uh and uh and the white house said a white house, there's an office that has been there for quite a while the white house faith and opportunity initiative and this, uh, this office in the White House um, was, I mean, there were 40 people, all of them evangelicals, even though the US is a plural religious country. Uh, and these people were traveling all across, not only Latin America, but the Middle East, um, preparing some deals, campaigning for political candidates, uh, um, for instance. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, during the camp, uh, both, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, uh, all these pastors who are celebrities of most of them prosperity gospel uh, here in the US were traveling uh, and doing uh, campaigning for Bolsonaro, organizing massive events in Brazil with uh, you know, local pastors. 
And we soon realized that it was, um, uh, this is not the US only exporting things. I mean, there's a climate now, um, just to give you some context, uh, back in the 90s, uh, Latin America was 95% Catholic. And now, uh, you know, the, the expansion, the expansion of um, the uh, non uh, evang evangelical churches that are not that have no denomination, which means are not ruled by any particular um, uh, person uh, or her uh, hierarchy. Uh, so these organizations were providing not only support uh, and money, which uh, um, open democracy clearly documented, but also they were making deals with presidents. For instance, in Guatemala, uh, Jimmy Morales, the president of, uh, former president of Guatemala, uh, was facing enormous pressure. Um, and he was, he was pretty much, I mean, the, the US uh, supported for years the UN mission in Guatemala to investigate corruption, the CICIC. Uh, and he was kicking this organization out of the country. The US did nothing uh, about it and the Trump administration uh, very much negotiated, uh, you know, taking a blind eye on, on, on this issue in exchange for Guatemala being the first, uh, the second country moving its embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Yeah. So uh, this is just one example of the kind of deals that were, um, negotiated by this uh, group of uh, pastors uh, on behalf of the White House. And this is why it really matters because they were not there, uh, uh, you know, as individuals, but representing the White House. And, uh, and not only in Central America, Brazil, but all across uh, the region, and even in, Guatem in Nicaragua. Um, so, you have all these regimes that are, uh, you know, Nicaragua, uh, Guatemala, and, and regimes that are really um, uh, having, uh, you know, attacking human rights in their own countries, uh, being supported uh, in exchange for an agenda, a political agenda, which is in this case is, you know, moving the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. And this is part, and, and, and that's why we need to investigate this globally because uh, it's impossible to connect the dots if you see just one country. So we found uh, large networks of that, uh, global networks actually, but operating primarily in the global South, Latin America, Africa. Uh, why? Because there, it's kind of a circle. Um, religion is a political tool it has always been for millennia and centuries. Uh, but now we're witnessing how this uh, political tool is used and nobody really understands um, why, because it's hard to see who's the victim here. You know, uh, you have, as one of the former presidents in Latin America told us, is there's nothing better than negotiating with the evangelicals is, is the, like every single candidate in the region will tell you the same thing. They even provide transportation during election time. Uh, so you have an, uh, a group of people who obey blindly what the pastor says. And, and basically the way it happens is there's a negotiation during the elections. Uh, the candidate in Mexico, for instance, we have stories in 15 countries. Um, uh, you can go to elclip.org and, and see them all. This is Transnationals of Faith. So uh, the candidate negotiates with, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Christian organizations. They give them their support in exchange of an agenda, blocking human, uh, women's uh, rights, uh, and uh, LGBT, those are the, I call them Troy horses <laughs> that they use. And, uh, and so once the agreement is done, before the election, they organize a massive event. And this is I guess, like all across Latin America, massive events with, with all 
the senior uh, pastors and the leadership and the people, uh, and basically they tell uh, their congregants, this is, the, this is the candidate appointed by God. Uh, and you know what happens next is uh, a, a really a circle of um, events when these people know, yeah, this is the candidate of God. Uh, they go to the they go to vote as as, as I saw at the beginning, and uh, supporting this 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 agenda. And and then of course what hap what ends up happening is uh, there's a disproportion between what they represent, I mean, these congregations and the rest of the world. And the thing is that because the agenda is fundamentalist um, and they say it openly, we want to rule and legislate according to the Bible, literally. Anything different than that is not, um, uh, is not acceptable. So I'm gonna share the screen just to show you uh, some of the uh, stories that we published in clip. Uh, so this is the main story about um, how uh, evangelical leaders totally supported by the White House uh, exported fundamentalist agenda and forced uh, um, leaders. So this is a picture that has been around for quite a while, but these are the people I'm talking about. Uh, all these pastors are, uh, had an office in the White House and were traveling the world uh, on behalf of the World House, uh, the White House. This is how they celebrated the, uh, how, the, when the US moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Um, well, we published at the same time the, when uh, a TV show in Netflix was uh, released, The Family. And so this is Jeff uh, Charlotte, uh, who read the story and, and, and thought, you know, this is, this is really, um, the, uh, this is something that has never been covered and let alone cross border. So uh, this is a Guatemala and how they negotiated impunity in exchange uh, to move in the embassy. Uh, this is uh, 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 Publica in, in Brazil. They published an amazing story showing how all these emissaries uh, from the White House were supporting um, Bolsonaro um, and his campaign, and also how other leaders who are not even from the right, uh, like in Mexico, were negotiating it as well with these groups. Um, well, finally, we followed up this investigation with another one because during this investigation we also noticed that some of the same groups that we were following um, or monitoring were also involved in um, money laundering. Um, so this is not the subject here but this is a follow-up on how organized crime has been using some of these uh, mega churches to launder uh, dirty money uh, across the world, not just in Latin America. So uh, thank you so much. And I'll be happy to answer any question. Well, I've got one, um, Janina, thank you very much. Uh, that too was great. And I appreciate um, the differentiation that you're saying it's about fundamentalism rather than religion. Um, and, um, but you're also saying that religion is used as a political tool and um, this is on the rise. Why do you think is it on the rise? I mean, is it new through the Trump administration? Why is there this increase or is it just that it's being investigated for the first time and has always been there? I think it, it has always been there. Come on, the Catholic Church is, uh, has the master <laughs> uh, on, on these for centuries since, uh, since uh, you know when when religion religion has always been there, the message here is that this is not new. How an administration? I mean, the way Trump it, did it is completely uh, out of uh, any other president, I will say, because uh, pluralism is very important. Is in the Constitution in the U.S. Um, and basically, what he did is Christianized all the federal government and beyond, uh, foreign aid. So he took it to another level, but this political tool only works when you have the people supporting it. Uh, 
under one umbrella, which is the Troy horses <laughs> um, and all this conservative agenda that is uh, you know, encouraged and supported and, 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 and turned into hate. And this is when we cross the border, I, I would say, um, from lovely religion to dangerous uh, human rights issues um, that affect us all. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so a lot of sort of difficult and sensitive questions of a judgment, and probably a lot of trolling and in return. Um, and we're actually pretty much bang on time for for taking questions now. Uh, I can see the chat has filled up, and um, Hannah is going to help with that. So over to you, Hannah. Hi. Um... I just want to say a big thank you to all the panelists for sharing um, their amazing stories. Um, and I want to start by asking Claire a question. Um, what were the surprises in your investigation and did the results confirm your initial theory or did you have to readjust your assumptions? Um, <clears throat> there were a lot of surprises. Uh, um, in the follow the money work that we did, one of the big surprises was uh, we didn't see um, an increase in uh, spending from Trump-linked groups during the Trump administration, at least not internationally. It wasn't striking. Um, the spending that we've uh, we do we document in those investigations, it predates Trump and it uh, we expect it to um, outlast uh, um, his administration as well. Um, uh, we didn't see a spike uh, or any sort of noticeable trend, though um, uh, perhaps for a subset of groups there is. That's something maybe to look into a bit more. Um, another surprise was uh, overall globally, the region that these, uh, the, the 28 groups that we looked at in the most recent project, the region that they spend most of their money in is uh, Europe overall. For some of these groups, as Lydia mentioned, they spend more in Africa, but overall as a group, they had spent more in Europe than anywhere else. And that was that was not what we had expected. Um, uh, these, uh, uh, um, uh, if we had found an increase in spending under Trump, that would have changed the storyline probably because we would have maybe led with that. Uh, um, the other, um, the fact that Europe was such a big focus of spending did mean that we uh, uh, assembled a sort of mini team in Europe to follow the money more in Europe and to look into some of the biggest funders in Europe in more detail. Um, and we hadn't planned to do that at the beginning because we weren't expecting to do that. So we did have to uh, adapt, absolutely. Another question that we've had is for um, Giannina and it was, so the obvious question is why focus on the right and not the left? Um, aren't right aren't left wing organizations also sending aid overseas to influence their own agendas? Yeah, well, actually, that was the reason why I started talking about fundamentalism. Uh, it, this is not ideological, as I said. Yeah, you know, Ralph Drollinger, who is a White House pastor under Trump's uh, administration, during uh, the time when uh, Daniel Ortega's regime in Nicaragua was killing people. He traveled to Nicaragua and, and we're talking about left here. So um, it, it, this goes beyond ideology. Um, it's, um, and why left or right? Well, the moment, uh, the moment you have an agenda that uh, is harming other people or it's forcing other people to live under certain rules um, that you don't, didn't decide, that's fundamentalism and, and, and the agenda, I mean, what they really want is to rule and legislate according to the Bible, the literal version that they um, believe in, which is fine. The problem is they, they want to force the rest of us to live under this uh, rule. So it doesn't really matter what religion it is. Uh, for instance, for the investigation on uh, money laundering, we did an enormous effort to search in 13 languages all across the world for cases involving churches and money laundering, um, regardless of the, the denomination. Um, so, that, so this is not about what well, it turned out, of course, because the, the 
you know, the Trump administration was totally aligned with uh, these evangelical pastors. 30% of the uh, Trump support comes from, uh, you know, what they call Christian nationalists. Um, and, and, and this has not been covered, not even here in the US, uh, in, in a critical way, systematically. In, honestly, if, if it was me, uh, you know, the, if I was the editor in chief of any US or global publication, I would have a religion desk uh, because these people have enormous influence in, in you know, what, and, and just to give you an, the last example, because I didn't cover this before. They are present in all the multilateral organizations, the UN, uh, the OAS. Uh, uh, of course, let me uh, try to explain what's the agenda. This, I'm not framing this like evil. They see, what they see is that the left is forcing them to live under certain uh, ways that they don't approve so in their minds, it's totally fine, which is fine. Anybody can go and influence in these organizations uh, to do the same thing using the same methods. And um, or, you know, these organizations have an army of lawyers working for them all across the world and being trained by, by, by them in order to promote this kind of fundamentalist um, legislation you know we saw from argentina all the way uh to guatemala mexico how they were present every time there was a discussion about uh, women's rights um or uh, lgbtq people uh, rights um and and really forcing uh, the discussion even um uh, you know mike pence had juan orlando hernandez Honduras president in his office in a bilateral meeting, official meeting in the White House. And then the first thing he asked him is, uh, we need our pastor to create a, uh, a mission in your country and the, uh, the presidency and the Congress, and he did. Um, so he's using political power to influence uh, other countries' policies uh, and agendas and negotiating with corrupt politicians. I mean, corrupt, uh, uh, as we know, um, you know, these three presidents in Central America, uh, even now are still, uh, are violating human rights. Um, and that was not an obstacle for any of these Christian organizations to, you know, negotiate uh, specific policies in exchange of uh, having this influence at the highest level. That's really interesting. Um, thank you, Giannina. I'm going to go back to Lydia. I'm really sorry about that. I think there was a technical issue with the different channels, but um, it would be great if you could um, yeah, let us know what you think and kind of expand on the point that you made before. Yes. So I think the, the, thing, the thing that most crisis pregnancy centers present themselves as is either a clinic to which you can go to uh, with a pregnancy. I mean, a pregnancy is a medical condition. It's not, uh, it's not a matter of belief. You, one is pregnant, they, that's a medical situation. And you may even walk in there. Uh, so it's either a charity responding to teenage pregnancy or, you know, people getting pregnant from rape and stuff like that. So that's one way they present themselves. And then as clinics, you as health clinics, and you may even go there and get an ultrasound uh, scan, but you, you definitely get counseling, which I think uh, regular people, you know, think of counseling as coming from a trained psychotherapist and stuff like that. But except that in this instance, everything is informed by faith. Right. So whatever medical options you may have that do not conform with this person's belief are out of the question. This person may very well have the, the only qualification they have is uh, they're all coming from their years of medical missionary work. So that's that's the that's the thing I think that's not like at all clear to people and 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 especially like in Uganda, you found 
really, really reputable corporate organizations, political figures, people, uh, I mean, donor organizations interested in responding to uh, pregnancy situations, uh, uh, you know, underage pregnancy and stuff like that, like associating with themselves, themselves with these organizations as either charities or legitimate uh, health options for women, you know. Thank you, Lydia. That that's really interesting, and um, I think your work sounds really good um, and really interesting. But we have just one final question um, that came in, and it was: Is there any evidence of involvement, active or passive, of the Vatican or bishops or other churches' comparable structures um, in your investigations? And maybe we can start with Claire. Okay, great. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Uh, Vatican is a huge political global player. Good question. Also a very complicated space. Uh, uh, so there are lots of different factions as well. I just wanted to, if it's okay, I just wanted to say one quick thing about the question about um, like, why don't we follow left-wing groups? And from our perspective on our project, we don't follow these Christian right groups because they're Christian right. We follow them because they are actively targeting women's and LGBT rights. And so they're part of an organized opposition to universal human rights. And that's why we follow them. Um, if they uh, stopped targeting women's and LGBT rights, they would fall off our, our project's agenda, frankly. Um, we also follow far right polit politicians that are not uh, particularly religious, uh, but target um, women's and LGBT rights. We also follow feminist groups that target trans rights and see trans rights as, uh, so they, th that target trans rights, uh, um, but most of them would call themselves left wing. Um, and we also um, uh, uh, share our findings and um, have, have had very strong reactions from within like religious communities, uh, faith leaders who are not at all pleased with uh, the use of their faith as an argument against women's and LGBT rights. So we also cover those divisions. And so we don't track, like from our perspective, we don't track these groups because they're religious. It's because of their impact on social and political life for people who are already excluded from a lot of social and political life. Um, and uh, on the point about the Vatican, um, uh, most, most particularly what's come onto our radar is, is uh, uh, you know, the factions within the Vatican and certain bishops that oppose Pope Francis. And there's like a big backlash, organized backlash to Pope Francis, also uh, very connected to many of the US groups that Lydia and I have been investigating um, for their other activities overseas. Uh, there has been a, a, and we've reported on this on Open Democracy as well, um, the concerted backlash uh, transnational against Pope Francis. Um, so I would say the Vatican is definitely a big player in this space, but it's not a, not really a singular entity uh, the way you might think. Uh, and there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, a pope bishops that oppose Pope Francis as well. And um, it's co a complicated space, but definitely involved. Thank you, Claire. Um, do, Giannina, would you like to say something on that point? Yes, absolutely. Um, as I said before, uh, we were not uh, targeting any denomination here, uh, but there's one difference, uh, practical difference. Uh, Catholic priests don't run for office, okay? They're, they're not allowed. And then you have uh, these other denominations that, uh, and there's a central structure under the Vatican. Um, so policies come from uh, and, and are followed by all, all the uh, Catholic branches. Uh, the difference with these other uh, evangelical groups is that they not only run for office, but uh, again, I mean, they want to just Trump appointed more than 400 uh, Christian judges in the U.S. So the, the idea is, um, you know, filling all these spaces with with um, people who think the same uh, as them. Now that being said, there uh, there is a and this is a long story, but the, the Catholic Church is divided right now, as Claire was saying, in in ways that we uh, in our lifetime probably never saw. 
Uh, so you have a radicalized group of Catholics who are in bed, <laughs> literally with these evangelical groups. And you see it in the World Congress of Families and not just Catholic, Muslims, uh, pretty much every radicalized religion. The World Congress of Families is like the United Nations of the fundamentalists. And it's, uh, and, and you have, you know, Muslims, uh, Orthodox, uh, pretty much every radicalized uh, group is represented over there, um, including the Catholics. Um, and so it's politics in, <laughs> in religion. And by understanding how it works and what unite, uh, I mean, these groups is, uh, I think, uh, something that we have to do in every part of the planet. So thank you for this opportunity. So I think I'm going to jump in here because we have run out of time and um, I can see we could spend a lot longer. And I think what's also fantastic about this session, how it just has connected the dots. I think we're all a bit tired um, being on Zoom, but but sometimes there really are advantages to it. And I feel that today was such a session um, where we're hearing from the US and uh, Trump administration. Uh, we hear about lobbying, uh, how they involved lobbying through Christian channels uh, for the Jerusalem embassy location, more lobbying in Italy, and then the impact of that money in uh, Zambia, Uganda, and South Africa. So it's been a truly global session um, with some amazing speakers. Thank you so much, and also for being so collaborative and, and sharing the tips and empowering other people, um, which is also what Hannah, Andrea, and Dave, and the interpreters at uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Network are doing by hosting these sessions, uh, which is fantastic. And really, they are hardly, I mean, not, I've not ever seen a boring one. So you're doing great work. Um, so thanks to, to everybody for putting this on. The next uh, sem webinar that's being run uh, is on in two weeks on Thursday, the 18th of March. And um, that's a subject with a subject that's um, of relevance to pretty much every single one of us as journalists, um, how investigative journalism organizations can improve audience engagement uh, and the distribution of their stories, which of course is usually topical as we have to do a lot of that ourselves um, in, in these days. So um, until the next session, check out um, the GIJN website for tips, tools and resources. And also, of course, uh, we can take this to social media. So thanks to everybody um, who's joined us and goodbye and see you at the next session.